my traditional plug for our practice group. So I'm John Malcolm. I'm the chairman of the criminal law uh, practice group. Uh, as many of you know, but probably all, not all of you know, these breakout sessions are planned by the practice groups, and we actually engage in quite a few activities throughout the year. Events, telefora, we solicit articles for the FedSoc blog and for the, uh, we used to be called Engage, I guess it's now the, the Federal Society Review. Uh, and we're always looking for people who are interested in, in volunteering their time. I always think that you get back far more than you put in, in terms of the camaraderie and, and you know, intellectual excitement uh, in terms of our activities. And so if anybody is interested in finding out more about the criminal law practice group and would potentially like to be involved, I'll be here for the entire convention and please seek me out. And if you can't for some reason, I'm at the Heritage Foundation and you can find me uh, there. So I think we have a terrific panel uh, planned for our breakout session. And we also have an outstanding moderator uh, to oversee that program. So, so Justice David Strauss is a graduate of the University of Kansas Law School. Uh, he did three clerkships, actually. He clerked first for uh, Melvin Brunetti on the Ninth Circuit and then Michael Ludig on the Fourth Circuit. He then clerked for Associate Justice Clarence Thomas. He spent a number of years as a law professor at the University of Minnesota Law School. And then in, uh, was it 2010? Yeah. 2010, Governor Tim Pawlenty uh, in his infinite wisdom and much to our benefit, uh, named uh, David as an associate justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court. So please join me in welcoming Justice David Strauss. Thank you, John, for that, that kind introduction. Um, I've been told that we got to do a little housekeeping uh, before we get started with the program, and I'll announce this again at the end, but um, the, the leadership wanted me to let you know that um, buses will be provided tonight um, to go to the annual dinner um, and that they will be boarded over on this side of the building and I'll give more details towards the end um, but they're going to start at five o'clock and they're going to go through uh, six o'clock and take folks to the dinner so with that out of the way um, you know the, uh, hopefully and I think this is true this is going to be an outstanding program um, we've got an outstanding set of scholars um, I think personally um, although I taught criminal law for a while I certainly don't know as much as as all the people on this panel about the topic. Um, but I think that Justice Scalia's um, criminal law and procedure jurisprudence is fascinating. Um, Justice Scalia didn't always end up uh, where I thought he would end up, and I think where a lot of people thought he would end up uh, in some of the cases he decided. But I think there is a sort of consistent theme uh, in his jurisprudence in a, in a number of different areas uh, in criminal law. So let me. Let me talk a little bit about what we're gonna do here. We're gonna spend a few, each panelist is gonna have a few minutes to talk um, about each of the subjects they wanna talk about, probably about 10 minutes. Um, then I may ask a question or two of, of, of each of the panelists or open it up to the audience, sort of depending on where the discussion goes. Um, but one, one emphasis that I wanna have is I wanna make sure that everyone out there gets a chance to talk and, uh, and, and gets a chance to ask questions if you have something that, that you wanna bring up. So. Without further ado, let's get started. Um, our first panelist, and I've been told to, to keep it short, so I've substantially sort of made these bios a little shorter, and you do have bios in your, in your materials. Our first speaker is Professor Oren Kerr, um, who is a nationally recognized scholar uh, in criminal procedure and computer crime law. He's also a frequent contributor to the Vala Conspiracy. Among his other uh, accomplishments, he was a trial attorney at the U.S. Department of Justice as well as a special assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia. He also clerked for Justice Anthony Kennedy on the United States Supreme Court and is considered a national expert on Fourth Amendment law um, and is especially proficient uh, at the intersection of the Fourth Amendment and uh, technology. Without further ado, Professor Kerr. Thank you so much, uh, Dave, and uh, to the Federal Society uh, for, for the invitation. I've uh, been a long time uh, a participant in Federal Society national conventions and never spoken, so I kind of feel like the person who calls into the radio program and says, long time listener, first time caller. Um, so, so hopefully the, the call will go okay. Um, I'm gonna talk about Justice Scalia's impact on the Fourth Amendment, the prohibition on unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, Justice Scalia had a significant impact on this body of law uh, that has been in part overlooked, and so I wanna tease out Justice Scalia's particular vision of the Fourth Amendment uh, and talk about what it did and what it didn't quite do. Uh, my view is that it had a significant impact on the doctrine 
uh, but that it was also more a matter of form than substance. So that's, that's the argument I want to make. So I should start by saying that Justice Scalia was not really a fan of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, he was interviewed uh, on C-SPAN a few years ago, and he was talking about how Chief Justice Rehnquist would assign opinions and how Chief Justice Rehnquist loved to write Fourth Amendment cases. And Justice Scalia said he did not actually like to write Fourth Amendment cases. He said, quote, I just hate Fourth Amendment cases. It's almost a jury question, you know, whether this variation is an unreasonable search or seizure. It's variation 3,542. Yes, I'll write the opinion, but I don't consider it a plum. Now, that hurts as someone who spends a lot of time working in the area of Fourth Amendment law, uh, to each his own, I suppose. Uh, but Justice Scalia actually did have a significant impact uh, on, the, on the body of law, despite not being a big fan of the Fourth Amendment. He had a vision in which he pursued sort of his two broad themes in his constitutional jurisprudence, one being originalism, uh, pursuing the uh, public meaning, original public meaning of the Constitution, and the other limiting judicial discretion, rules instead of standards. And of course, those work together. If you have to follow the original public meaning, uh, then that will cabin the discretion of judges. Uh, and, and Justice Scalia pursued this uh, in the following way. He looked at Fourth Amendment doctrine as he came to the court in the 1980s and saw a body of judge-made law that invested judges with a great deal of judicial discretion. A good example of this is the CATS Reasonable Expectation of Privacy Test that governs what is a search. Uh, in 1998, in Minnesota versus Carter, Justice Scalia wrote a concurring opinion condemning the doctrine. He said it has, it's a self-indulgent test that has no plausible foundation in the text of the Fourth Amendment. He wrote, the Fourth Amendment did not guarantee some generalized right to privacy and leave it to this court to determine which particular manifestations of the value of privacy society is prepared to recognize as reasonable. Uh, if, if society wants to make that judgment, they should do so with the elected branches, not with the courts. And so he, he disagreed with the Katz test as infusing too much discretion in judges. And he had a similar view of constitutional reasonableness. Once the Fourth Amendment recognizes conduct as a search or seizure, the courts have to say what's reasonable. And he objected to the kind of judges make up what's reasonable based on their sense of the time approach that he had seen in some earlier cases. Uh, so what did he do about it? What's his, his vision of the Fourth Amendment? I, uh, Justice Scalia basically divided the world into the old and the new. Uh, and he tried to carve out the kind of old original Fourth Amendment and distinguish it from the new uh, 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 sort of uh, newly developed Fourth Amendment in the following way. So first, the test for what is a search in the United States versus Jones, Justice Scalia uh, in a, a five justice majority opinion held that the test for what is a search actually has two components. There's first what is a reasonable expectation of privacy, the CATS test, but there is also a physical intrusion or trespass test. If government conduct is a trespass, uh, it counts as a Fourth Amendment search regardless of whether there was a violation of a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, the idea was to make what had been understood to be the one, part, the single test, the reasonable expectation of privacy test, into two different tests, old trespass, new reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, uh, this led to a lot of kind of curiosity to Fourth Amendment scholars. There were a lot of people who had to rewrite treatises and case books and uh, commercial outlines because everybody had understood the CATS test to be the only test in town. Uh, not so after Jones. There's a division between these two different tests, trespass and reasonable expectation of privacy. So that's one change uh, which was really driven by Justice Scalia and his majority opinion in Jones. The other t uh, change was to alter the test for Fourth Amendment reasonableness. Instead of it being a free form inquiry where judges determine in that context what's reasonable, uh, you look to see whether it's an old problem that was answered at common law. Uh, this is what Justice Scalia wrote in Arizona versus Gantt in his concurring opinion. To determine what is an unreasonable search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment, we look first to the historical practices the framers sought to preserve. If those provide inadequate guidance, we apply traditional standards of reasonableness, that is sort of judge-made uh, standards. Uh, has he put the same point uh, uh, a, a few years earlier in Veronia School District versus Acton? We look for a clear practice, either approving or disapproving the type of search at issue at the time the constitutional provision was enacted. Uh, so what does that mean? It means when trying to figure out what's constitutional, what uh, searches are constitutionally reasonable, you 
look to whether there was a common law answer. There were common law rules of search and seizure. And if there's a clear answer to that specific practice, you follow the common law rule. On the other hand, if there's no clear answer or if it's a new set of facts, if it's something, say, involving technology uh, or cars or something which just didn't exist at common law, then you can apply a more general reasonableness approach. Uh, so these are some pretty significant changes because they basically divide the Fourth Amendment world doctrinally into the old and the new, the trespass, common law answer, uh, reasonable expectation of privacy, and more general reasonableness answer. Uh, and I think of them as kind of plausibly originalist approaches to the Fourth Amendment. I say plausibly originalist because, well, it's not, it's not clear that this was sort of a serious originalist approach. It's not obvious that trespass was the test or the uh, original understanding of what is a search was based on trespass. Rather, we know that the cases that inspired the passage of the Fourth Amendment, Entick versus Carrington from 1765 most prominently, involved civil claims alleging trespass, and so what was a trespass was relevant to establish the cause of action. In that context, the common law search and seizure rules were an affirmative defense to the trespass action. It's not obvious that means that trespass is actually the original public understanding of search, but it's at least a plausible historical way of rooting Fourth Amendment doctrine in some sort of objective test, or at least something that cabins the discretion of judges. I always wondered what Justice Scalia wanted to do with these, this bifurcation, this dividing up the doctrine as he did. Uh, it, always a possibility that maybe he was trying to cut off the trespass parts of cats with the hope that being someday he could kill cats, uh, that he could cut off that newfound part, because just dividing the doctrine into two on its own doesn't really make an obvious difference. It just sort of depends on which doctrinal box you're going to. Uh, of course, we'll never know uh, where, where Justice Scalia was going. Uh, and at least as, uh, as the cases came down at the time of his death, it's not obvious that these changes had a big impact in terms of uh, actual outcomes. So uh, as I suggested, dividing the law of searches into trespass searches and reasonable expectation of privacy searches, it may just be moving doctrinal boxes around. The court had held in Rockets versus Illinois, or it indicated in a footnote, that if there's a trespass, then there's going to be a violation of a reasonable expectation of privacy. So you could have just kept it all under the reasonable expectation of privacy rubric without specifically dividing out trespass. It's not obvious that anything is gained in terms of outcomes by dividing it, although conceptually, doctrinally, in terms of black letter law, it's a pretty significant difference. Um, I think you can say more about the impact of the switch to reasonableness in that that can actually cabin the discretion of judges if they have to stick with a common law rule to the extent it's an old practice and a clear common law answer. Uh, that's what the court should follow. That's pretty different from the law before Justice Scalia joined the court. Uh, for example, in Peyton versus New York from the early 1980s, the court uh, 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 rejected the common law rule for whether a warrant was required to enter a house uh, to execute, uh, to, to arrest someone rather. Uh, the common law rule was that no warrant was required. The court said a warrant was required and it was based on policy grounds. Sort of, well, it doesn't really work to say there's no warrant required. Um, and it was more of a flea, free floating reasonableness idea. Uh, uh, at least under Justice Scalia's methodology, that would not presumably have been the approach the court took because there was a clear common law uh, answer and it was a set of facts that were uh, clear at, at common law. Um, with that said, it's, it's also not obvious that the methodology of looking to common law first is actually going to cabin judges all that much because it's, of course, pretty easy to say, uh, I look at the common law and I don't see a clear answer, uh, or I think this set of facts is a new set of facts. It's always easy to say, well, the world has changed, uh, therefore the old common law answer doesn't apply. We haven't really seen cases where the courts say, you know, we wish we could go in a different direction, but we're cabined by this, this framework. And it's also, I think, a little early to say that this framework is established in the cases in the sense that if a court doesn't follow it, they look odd. Um, that framework has been followed recently, for example, in the Birchfield case in an opinion by Justice Scalia, who said, you know, uh, t testing for blood and breath uh, for DUI ar arrests, that's a new set of problems, so we just look to general reasonableness. We haven't seen the cases where there's a real tension there where the, the judges or justices divide. Um, but it's at least possible that, that that cabins the discretion of judges in a significant way. Um, certainly for a body of law that Justice Scalia himself <laughs> said he didn't like, uh, he had a significant impact beyond his votes in changing the, the black letter law and in at least on its, on its surface 
saying, listen, there's a understanding of what the Fourth Amendment means. It is the original understanding of what the Fourth Amendment means. That is a rock solid piece of the doctrine. The judges can monkey around with the other parts, but they have to keep that initial part preserved. And I think that's a pretty significant accomplishment for a justice. So thank you for listening. I look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you, Professor Kerr. Um, one more thing I forgot to mention, but uh, you probably noticed that we have uh, four excellent panelists up here, but your program suggests that we should have five. Um, unfortunately, Justice Markman was unable to be with us today. Um, so I wanted to let you know um, that hopefully the rest of us can cover some of the material he was gonna cover, and if not, um, feel free to ask questions about that um, when, when we're done. All right, so our next panelist is uh, Professor Rachel Barco, um, who is the Siegel Family Professor of Regulatory Law and Policy and the Faculty Director of the Center on the Administration of Criminal Law at New York University Law School. She's also a member of the United States Sentencing Commission. She teaches courses in criminal law, administrative law, and constitutional law. She also clerked for Justice Scalia, so she will have unique insights uh, on our topic today. And her scholarship, as her resume would suggest, focuses on criminal law um, and especially the intersections of administrative law, constitutional law, and obviously criminal law. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Professor Barco. Oh, thank you very much, Judge. Um, so I'm glad we're doing a panel on criminal law today um, in large measure because I think this is one of the areas where you really see Justice Scalia's commitment to law regardless of what the outcome is in a particular case. And I think you really get a sense of non-ideological voting here, um, which I think is very commendable in a judge. Uh, so lots of things we could be talking about and it was hard for me to pick one. But today I wanna talk about the ways in which Justice Scalia Scalia's commitment to textualism benefited criminal defendants, and I'm going to focus on two areas. So the first um, is how textualism affected his approach to vagueness challenges, and then second, how he interpreted statutes more generally, um, and why a commitment to textualism uh, is more likely, though not always, but more likely to going to benefit criminal defendants, more than a statutory approach that goes and looks at a statute's broader purpose or looks at legislative history. Um, so first, to start with the vagueness cases. Um, for years, Justice Scalia had been lamenting uh, that there were circuit splits and a lot of confusion uh, of a law called the Armed Career Criminal Act, or ACCA, uh, as it's known. So under ACCA, if you are a felon in possession of a firearm, uh, you get a 15-year mandatory minimum and you can get up to a life sentence. Um, if you have three prior convictions for serious drug offenses or violent felonies. And so the key to the law is what are the violent felonies that trigger this mandatory minimum and get you within its scope. And the way that the act defines these, uh, it has a list of some, so those are the enumerated felonies, um, and then it explains that even if a felony is not one of the ones that's listed and enumerated, um, that you could still be held uh, pursuant to ACCA and qualify for it, uh, as long as the felony is violent, if it, in, it, if it involves the use, attempted use, or threatened use of physical force, or, and then this is the key part of the statute that uh, drew Justice Scalia's ire, um, if it otherwise involves conduct that presents a serious potential risk of physical injury to another. All right, so that last uh, part of the law is known as the residual clause in ACCA. And for years, Justice Scalia had been saying, this is unconstitutionally vague. No one knows what this means. Um, so he first mentioned it in a dissent in a 2007 case, uh, James versus United States. And at that point, he just had Justice Ginsburg and Justice Stevens along for the ride. Uh, but if you know Justice Scalia or you followed him, um, not one to give up easily. Um, so he repeatedly called out problems with this law whenever he had the opportunity. He dissented again in 2011 in a case called Sykes. Um, and this time he also got Justice Kagan to join uh, his dissent. She had since joined the court and agreed with him. And eventually in 2015, he got seven justices to agree with him. So you know, one, it's an interesting substantive area to look at, but it also shows that over time the justice did get other justices to see his point of view on things, uh, which sometimes gets overlooked, I think. Um, so in Johnson versus United States, uh, Justice Scalia, he noted in his opinion uh, that this statute was in fact unconstitutionally vague because the wording of the statute leaves grave uncertainty about how much risk it takes for a crime to qualify as a violent felony. All right, so in April of this year, uh, after Justice Scalia passed away, the court ultimately decided that Johnson, um, this decision holding this clause to be unconstitutionally vague, that it applies retroactively. And there are thousands of petitions pending in the courts for people seeking to have their sentences reduced as a result. Now, 
know, I think it's safe to say um, that the people who are getting ACCA relief aren't exactly the preferred constituency of Justice Scalia. Um, the people who get these Johnson motions, um, they're not people with three prior drug offenses that fall within the 15-year mandatory minimum. Um, these people, by definition, have to have a felony that was thought to have been violent. Um, and if you look at Johnson himself, I think you'll see that these are not always the most sympathetic figures. Johnson was a white supremacist uh, who the FBI had been monitoring because they were concerned he was gonna commit a terrorist act. Um, he had, in the words of Justice Scalia, or I'm sorry, this Justice Alito, had said that uh, Johnson led a life of crime and violence uh, and had prior convictions for robbery, attempted robbery, illegal possession of a sawed-off shotgun, and a drug offense. Um, so it wasn't, I don't think, that Justice Scalia was particularly moved by Mr. Johnson's predicament. Uh, he was interested in a broader legal principle. Um, and so that commitment to the broader legal principle transcended whatever the facts were of a particular case, and he stuck with it. Um, and he noted in particular, when he dissented in Sykes, uh, what it was that vagueness doctrine is supposed to be about and what concerned him. And I think it's worth paying attention to this because of his commitment. He said, and this is a quote, we face a Congress that puts forth an ever-increasing volume of laws in general and of criminal laws in particular. It should be no surprise that as the volume increases, so do the number of imprecise laws. And no surprise that our indulgence of imprecisions that violate the Constitution encourages imprecisions that violate the Constitution. Fuzzy, leave the details to be sorted out by the court's legislation is attractive to the congressman who wants credit for addressing a national problem, but does not have the time or perhaps the votes to grapple with the nitty gritty. In the field of criminal law, at least, it is time to call a halt. I do not think it would be a radical step. Indeed, I think it would be highly responsible to limit ACCA to the named violent crimes. Congress can quickly add what it wishes. Uh, so I think it's really important to pay, you know, Justice Scalia meant what he said. You know, Congress, you want a list of felonies? Put them in there. But if you are going to just pass vague laws, the Constitution will not allow you to take somebody's liberty away on that basis, no matter how the particular facts of a case may look or how unsympathetic that person may be. Um, it wasn't the first time that Justice Scalia ruled a statute had been void for vagueness. Uh, he did the same thing in Skilling versus United States, where he found the honest services theory of mail and wire fraud to be void for vagueness. Um, and there, the majority was uh, saved the statute or tried to save the statute by interpreting it to say, well, it's not just honest services, fine. We'll say it's, it's limited to bribes and kickbacks. Uh, but Justice Scalia refused to sign on to that because in his view, he said, a statute could not be saved by, quote, judicial construction that writes in specific criteria that its text does not contain. Um, and then he concluded his concurrence there with a quote from Justice Waite that, quote, it would be dangerous if the legislature could set a net large enough to catch all possible offenders and leave it to the courts to step inside and say who could be rightfully detained and who should be set at large. Um, so in these vagueness cases, you see Justice Scalia guided by his view that the statute has to be clear on its face if you're going to hold somebody criminally responsible for violating its terms. And you can't just have the courts wrap, you know, fix things later. Um, it's got to be clear from the outset. And you'll see this same theme in the second area that I wanted to emphasize, which is his interpretation of criminal statutes, even when there's not a constitutional vagueness issue, just, you know, run-of-the-mill, what does the statute mean? Um, here, his commitment to textualism meant that uh, he read statutes to reach no further than what they said. Um, and if they weren't clear on his face, his commitment to the rule of lenity meant that they were interpreted in favor of criminal defendants. Uh, he explained this in Santos versus United States, where he said the rule of lenity places the weight of inertia upon the party, the government, that can best induce Congress to speak more clearly. Right, so he had a very clear framework of how our government is supposed to work when it comes to criminal law. You need to get Congress to specifically say what it is that you cannot do before someone can be criminally punished. And if there's any ambiguity, that goes in favor of the criminal defendant. And if the government doesn't like that outcome, as he pointed out, the government is in the best position to go ask Congress to fix it, right? It'd be much harder for a criminal defendant to do that had the government won those ties or in those ambiguous contexts. Um, now, justices who use legislative history to interpret statutes often disagreed with Justice Scalia in cases, and they would rule for the government because they thought the legislative history would clear things up. You could look at it, you could figure out what the broader purpose was. Uh, but Justice Scalia always required more of our government before he allowed it to interfere with individual liberty. Um, if you wanted to get something, uh, if you wanted to criminally punish somebody, you had to get clear language passed by 
both the House and the Senate and signed by the President. And you know, you see this throughout his approach to statutory interpretation, uh, whether it's administrative law or it's criminal law, um, and that it's, I think it's important to note that he was just adamant that this is what liberty requires. It has to go through bicameralism and presentment, and the language has to be clear. So while we have some justices on the court who I know favor a more active government role, um, Justice Scalia always demanded more before someone's individual liberty could be taken away. Um, and in my view, our constitutional order is far greater because of it. Thank you, Professor Barco. Um, our next speaker, uh, Stephanos Bibas, who's a University of Pennsylvania Law School professor. He studies the powers and incentives that shape how prosecutors, defense counsel, defendants, and judges behave in the world, real world. Um, he also studies the divorce between criminal procedures focus on efficiency and criminal law's interest in healing victims, defendants, and communities. Um, he, in addition to having served as a clerk for Justice Kennedy, uh, he's the director of uh, Penn's Supreme Court Clinic, um, where he and his students had litigated a wide variety of cases, but one notable one is Padilla versus Kentucky, um, which has caused certainly a lot of work for a lot of state courts and other federal courts. It's a big case, um, in case involving the right to counsel for uh, non-citizen criminal defendants. Um, as a personal note, I'd like to thank him, um, a colleague of mine who is the head of the Minnesota Sentencing Commission, uh, had some issues with sentencing, and Professor Bebas was kind enough uh, to help my colleague out. So as a matter of personal privilege, I just want to extend my thanks and turn it over to him. Thank you, Justice Strauss. Thank you, all of you. This is a very uh, distinguished panel I'm honored to, to be included in. Uh, and in many ways, my comments are going to kind of parallel or pick up on those you've just heard from, uh, from my dear friend Rachel Barco. I'm going to talk about the Sixth Amendment and try to draw together threads from three different clauses of the Sixth Amendment. So there's the Confrontation Clause, uh, and Justice Scalia spearheaded the Crawford line of cases, which said that if you want to bring in testimony from a witness, you need that witness physically present in open court to be cross-examined. There's the Jury Trial Guarantee, which in the Apprendi Blakely line of cases, he spearheaded the, the guarantee that if a fact raises the maximum statutory or guidelines sentence, that it has to be proved to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. And then there's the uh, assistance of counsel clause, where Justice Scalia has been in dissent in Padilla and Lafler and Fry in efforts to extend the reach of the assistance of counsel clause to, to plea bargaining and, and guilty pleas, which the majority has done and Justice Scalia has resisted. Um, so the first, I'm going to talk about his methodology. I'm going to talk about the importance of clarity and then finish up with the discussion of the separation of powers. First of all, in terms of methodology, the first point I want to stress is he had one. And it's hard for us to think back, but you know, a certain generation of lawyers can remember back when litigating these cases was an anything goes kind of endeavor, whatever you can throw in. You know, there were cases in other areas where we look at the legislative history, it's unclear, then we turn to the text. Uh, there wasn't a clear way in which one approached these cases. There wasn't a clear vocabulary because there wasn't a clear point to the judicial exercise. It is very important that Justice Scalia changed the terms of the debate. There is now a vocabulary in the Crawford line of cases. We focus, the clause speaks of, of anyone who is brought to bring, uh, to, to be a, a witness, someone who gives testimony in a case. And so that includes certain people who are trying to become declarants to in inculpate somebody. And then it excludes some other things, which maybe they're technically under the rules of hearsay, but the rules of hearsay got confused with what the Confrontation Clause itself governs. Um, the jury trial guarantee is another place where there was no clear focus. What is an element of a crime that has to be proved to a jury? What is a sentencing factor? And Justice Scalia, very importantly, focused on the importance of preserving the jury's role of defining the jury's role, of understanding what the jury's role is in contradistinction to judges and prosecutors. And these cases are just litigated very differently. Win or lose, one had to grapple with his terms and his engagement with the very specifics of the clauses, as well as their uh, structural role and their historical purpose and context. And I, I do want to stress that, as, as uh, Professor Barco mentioned, this approach and methodology is grounded in law. There is law here, there are tests. One has to be a textualist. And uh, his originalism 
is a public meaning objective originalism grounded in the text. It's not just politics. Now again, that might seem obvious with the benefit of hindsight, but take a look at the confrontation clause. Before Crawford in 2004, there was a generation of lawyers who had to learn Ohio versus Roberts. So from 1980 to 2003 or 2004, you had to argue about, well, this is hearsay, the Confrontation Clause supposedly has a preference for live testimony. The preference is not absolute. We can allow things if it's if they are grounded, if the hearsay is grounded in a firmly rooted hearsay exception or bears particularized guarantees of trustworthiness. So seven factor, eight factor, nine factor balancing test, completely unpredictable. Um, the Crawford opinion itself cataloged a number of lower court cases in which, well, if the hearsay is very recent then it sounds like it's an excited utterance. We ought to let it in because it wasn't fabricated. If the hearsay is very old, well, it has long-standing guarantees of authenticity, let's let it in. And there was really no check. Heads I win, tails you lose. We, we don't want to let this criminal defendant off. We don't want that criminal defendant off. And so the clause came to be kind of meaningless. Um, and the same could be argued about the, six, the, uh, the jury trial guarantees. You know, how much is too much discretion for the judge at sentencing? Wide open sentencing discretion, surely there's something that the legislature can't hand off from the jury to the judge. Um, there is a grounding in law, in text, in, in roles of actors that Justice Scalia brought and a rigor that was missing from these debates until his, his bracing take on them was brought to bear. By the way, it's also worth noting that as, as uh, Professor Barco mentioned, his methodology created odd bedfellows. It constantly irks me that newspaper reporters want to paint the Supreme Court in left versus right divide. And one of the things to Justice Scalia's great credit is he constrained his own political preferences. He ruled for a lot of people and we candidly said, I don't like these people. You know, Ralph Blakely is someone who kidnapped his wife and confined her in a coffin-like box in the back of his truck. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of very unsympathetic characters, you know, the flag burning case is another example outside of criminal law, where he was very clear about saying, I don't like this personally, but this is where a consistent principled methodology takes us. And that made him very different from some other, maybe more results oriented justices, and it's, it's important to underscoring that this is about the rule of law, not politics. Uh, my second point is one of clarity. Justice Scalia's methodology in the Fourth Amendment, the text doesn't necessarily generate formalism when it talks about reasonableness, but in the Sixth Amendment context, this textualism brought out certain bright line rules. And I think uh, he certainly liked bright line rules, but they also served some of these rule of law values pretty well. One of his arguments was it's important to give people notice, fair notice of what's going to be uh, admissible in court, what kinds of penalties a criminal defendant is going to face, what, is, what a defendant is or isn't entitled to as a matter of his defense lawyering to protect against some maximum sentences but not against the possibility of losing out on leniency in the plea bargaining context. I personally view that as one of the less successful arguments because there's a fiction that criminals actually know the prospective punishments when they, when they burglarize. I don't know that many criminal defendants who, who actually read the statute books. A better argument for clarity they had advanced is that clarity is important to constraining the discretion of those in the system. Uh, and I think he, his, his writing, his very trenchant, you know, beautifully pointed writing brought out this point. The best example I can think of is in the Apprendi line of cases. There was a case called McMillan versus Pennsylvania about 30 years ago that said, ah, we think it's, it's good enough for government work if a judge triggers a mandatory minimum sentence as long as the, the sentence enhancement doesn't go so far as to allow the tail to wag the dog. Now, Justice Scalia had great fun with this, the subjectivity, the obvious subjectivity of this test, uh, because it was very murky. It, people could always disagree, judges could always disagree about whether a particular enhancement went too far, and there was no way to falsify it. It was basically personal preferences. He had a footnote uh, in which he wrote that, in uh, Blakely, I think, that he was terminating this line of jurisprudence because the tail wags the dog rule would, quote, require that the ratio of sentencing factor add-ons to basic criminal sentence be no greater than the ratio of caudal vertebrae to body in the breed of canine with the longest tail, or perhaps no greater than the average such ratio for all breeds, or perhaps the median. Regrettably, Apprendi has prevented full dis 
development of this line of jurisprudence. He, he made reading footnotes fun because it's obvious what the problem is with the tail wags the dog. There's no standard there. There's no test. It's, I, I know when I see it, and surely we can do better in this area. And a third importance of clarity that, uh, that Professor Barker alluded to is that Justice Scalia prized liberty over efficiency. There's a real contrast between Justice Scalia and Justice Breyer in this area. So Justice Breyer, in his Apprendi dissent, pointed out, you know, sentencing commissions make a lot of policy sense. They're the wave of the future. They're experts. We ought to learn from them. I have some sympathy myself for that, that policy position. Justice Scalia's concurrence responded, you know, Justice Scalia has sketched, uh, Justice Breyer, in his dissent, has sketched out an admirably fair and efficient approach to criminal justice. But the framers didn't embrace that. They took a different tack. Our Constitution has not always been efficient, but it has always been free. So there's a trade-off. And he embraced that trade-off and he grasped the nettle, but that he saw a broader virtue in embracing this kind of clarity and in protecting liberty and not just pursuing efficiency and experiments that might, might muddy things. And this brings me to a final point, which is the importance of the separation of powers in protecting juries and protecting liberty. And Professor Barco is, is maybe the leading scholar of the separation of powers in criminal procedure. I think it, uh, you know, rule of lenity and vagueness are part of that, but another part of that is the way the Sixth Amendment plays out. First of all, he understood the Bill of Rights is about half of the Bill of Rights is criminal procedure, and it is a set of restrictions on government power. The government's ability to punish people is an awesome power, and it has to be exercised vigorously to protect us, but it has to be restrained by checks. And these restraints are important to preserving liberty, which he kept underscoring. Secondly, he saw the importance of democracy as a counterweight to expertise, and the jury as the locus of democracy. That prosecutors, and I'm proud to be a former prosecutor, and judges are nevertheless functionaries of the state, and they have to satisfy a jury unanimously, beyond a reasonable doubt, that someone deserves to have the, to be thrown in prison, to lose liberty, to have the stigma of a conviction. Um, and he powerfully wrote about the importance of the jury seeing the witness be cross-examined to satisfy itself, not some judge deciding that the hearsay is reliable, but the jury deciding for itself. The Constitution enshrines a procedure to ensure that the jury makes that determination, not a substantive requirement that the judge decide for himself or herself that it's reliable. The Constitution guarantees that the jury authorize a certain sentence, not that the judge decide what is enough, of a, enough proof. Um, and that separation of powers is an important part of our history, I would stress, the history of the colonists trying to check this authority. Now, I want to offer a note of, uh, of, of caution at the end because I think a fair counterargument to Justice Scalia's approach is that while it works pretty well and is pretty faithful for problems from the 18th century, it might be arguably less workable in problems that are unpredictable that aren't addressed by the text or the history. So in the Fourth Amendment area, Professor Kerr hasn't spoken about this, but you, you know, you're aware there are big recent cases involving the use of GPS tracking and forming a mosaic of a bunch of data, or deep, uh, cheek swabs to gather DNA or thermal imaging. It's at least strained to say that using thermal imaging devices is kind of like watching snow melt in the 18th century. But in, in this area, in the Sixth Amendment, I think there are real problems with taking a confrontation clause that's designed for live witness testimony and applying it just hook, line, and sinker to forensic testimony. I think confrontation clause works pretty well when you're talking about lay witnesses, the, the, the obvious incentives to fabricate, but when we're talking about problems of DNA analysis and chains of custody, et cetera, it's at least arguable that that might be a, an extension beyond where the text takes you. We ought to start there, but not clear that it ends the analysis. Um, the same thing when it comes to modern sentencing schemes. Again, a fair counterargument is Insofar as we have historical parallels, it's good to make sure the jury has some role, but does it necessarily preclude a scheme that might have more protections in it than indeterminate sentencing? Um, and probably my biggest uh, qualification in this area is the plea bargaining er uh, cases, the ones in which he was in dissent. Justice Scalia, even Justice Thomas, are unwilling to dynamite the plea bargaining edifice. There is a consistent originalist argument that plea bargaining does not fit with the Constitution. Go read Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution. The trial of all criminal cases shall be by jury. Looks like that was made to be a non-waivable structural check. 
If you do that, you have no plea bargaining and no plea bargaining problem. But if you are going to have plea bargaining and then you're going to make the Sixth Amendment guarantee a counsel meaningful in that world, you know, you can take two approaches. You can take a formalist approach, which is Justice Scalia's, where he said, you basically, if you are getting a discount in plea bargaining, uh, you shouldn't have any rights because it's just unfettered leniency and leniency doesn't threaten these rule of law maximum sentence values. He said the majority was embracing, embraces the sporting chance theory of criminal law in which the state functions like a conscientious casino operator, giving each player a fair chance to beat the house, that is to serve less time than the law says he deserves. From a formalist perspective, maybe. From a functionalist perspective, it's not like a few people are getting a, a roulette wheel of leniency. Almost everybody is. And the real world is one in which most people are getting a going rate determined by plea bargaining. And Justice Scalia wasn't going to take or extend Sixth Amendment protections to a world that nevertheless a post-originalist world that the court was willing to allow. Those quibbles aside, there is no question that Justice Scalia has left a lasting legacy. His vocabulary, his methodology have changed the terms of the debate. They've reinvigorated the Sixth Amendment and there's something that everybody has to grapple with. It's telling that most of the justices on the court have signed on to some of the unusual left-right coalitions involved here. That formal, that, you know, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Souter, Justice Stevens, uh, you know, now Justice Kagan and often Sotomayor have signed on to many of these opinions. So even non-committed originalists see the virtue in a method, in a purpose, in making these clauses mean something, even though they disagree about the details, even though they sometimes get off the train with him at certain points. So the, his legacy endures and it is an important testament to the rule of criminal law as a law of rules and not one of naked po politics or discretion. Thank you, Professor. Um, our final speaker uh, is Paul Larkin uh, from the Heritage Foundation. Um, he uh, directs the Heritage Foundation's project to counter abuse of the criminal law, uh, particularly at the federal level. Um, and he's part of the overcriminalization project of Heritage, Heritage's Rule of Law Initiative. Before joining Heritage in September of 2011, he held various positions with uh, the federal government. At the US, he was at the U.S. Department of Justice from 1984 to 1993 uh, as an assistant to the Solicitor General and as an attorney in the Criminal Division on Organized Crime and Racketeering. He has argued 27 cases before the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court. Um, he was also a law clerk uh, for the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit for Judge Robert Bork. I will turn it over to Mr. Larkin. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And it's an honor to be here. I want to thank the Federalist Society for giving me this opportunity to be on a panel with three very brilliant professors. A few weeks ago, I was at a conference in Virginia, and the night before I had dinner with some students and some of the other conference attendees, one of whom was Alan Morrison. And I, and I said to Alan that I think it, a good argument can be made that Justice Scalia was one of the best friends that defendants had when they came before him in his court. Alan immediately interjected, no, 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 look at all his habeas jurisprudence, nobody ever got any relief. To which I said, Alan, those are prisoners, they're not defendants. By this point, they are already guilty and an entirely different set of rules applies. As my colleagues have mentioned, history uh, is an important feature for Justice Scalia in interpreting the substantive provisions of the Constitution. But it was also an important provision for him in some of the substantive criminal cases that he had. Now, his substantive criminal law jurisprudence was narrow, intentionally so. He took to heart the lesson that the Supreme Court taught years ago when the Marshall Court decided the Hudson and Goodwin case that it is not the province of the federal courts to decide what is and is not a crime. It is the province of Congress to do that. And as a result, as Professor Barkhouse said, he read statutes strictly, not always a way that the Justice Department would have liked. In fact, there are a variety of different cases that may have never gotten his vote if he had been on the court when those cases were decided. And by that, I'm meant, I think in particular of the Turquette case dealing with the RICO Act. There are a variety of different decisions he, he handed down in the substantive criminal law area. Now, federal jurisdiction is pretty uh, narrow in this regard, and every crime will be a statutory crime. So 
Professor Barkow, Rachel has talked about how he read statutes. I'm not going to address that part because that's already been covered. But what I want to talk about is his use of the common law. He relied on the common law very heavily in a variety of different cases. For example, Shad versus Arizona, he wrote a concurring opinion dealing with the issue of whether you could have multiple bases for a conviction or whether the jury had to be unanimous on only one of them. For example, did the defendant murder the victim or did he, the victim die in the course of a felony? Now that for him was a pretty easy one since what you're getting at really didn't matter much. But he also said that at common law it didn't make a difference which basis the jury convicted on as long as they were unanimous about the underlying offense. And the common law for him was dispositive in that. In McCormick versus United States, rather than get into an esoteric discussion about the relationship between the criminal law and the political process, he relied on the distortion and used that as a way of trying to limit the problem that resulted when you tried to apply an old statute that sounded like a common law statute to contemporary political processes. He relied heavily on the common law in order to address the question of whether drunkenness is a defense to a crime. The common law had rejected it. Under, at the common law, drunkenness was immoral and an offense in and of itself. So the idea that drunkenness could serve as a defense to a crime uh, was alien to Blackstone and the others. And for him, that was dispositive. The Constitution didn't require that what had been permitted through or commanded throughout history be done entirely differently. So for him, there was no entitlement to a drunkenness defense, even as to a specific intent crime. He followed the same sort of approach in Smith versus United States, which dealt with the withdrawal from a conspiracy, and Sikar versus United States, which dealt with the definition, again, of extortion. In fact, to some extent, the best example of what Prof Professor Barkow talked about with his reliance on the statute is his decision in a case called uh, Brogan versus United States, which dealt with the so-called exculpatory no doctrine. It had been developed under false statement cases that if a suspect said he was innocent to a police officer, uh, the police officer and the prosecution couldn't charge him with uh, lying to a federal official. He absolutely flatly refused to create any such common law exception to the Federal False Statements Act because there was no similar exception to common law and more importantly, he saw it as not being his responsibility to create federal common law in this regard, even when in this case it would have helped the defendant. But there is one case that I want to like to talk a little bit about where he relied heavily on the common law. My colleague, Professor Bebas, was mildly critical of Justice Scalia for his uh, decisions in some cases. But there is one case that he just got flat wrong. It's a case called Griffin versus United States. It dealt with the problem of jury instructions that permitted multiple potential bases for a conviction where you know one of them on appeal is clearly wrong. And he relied very heavily on the common law in rejecting Griffin's argument for a unanimous court, I have to confess, uh, that the indecision in this regard required it be resolved in favor of the defendant and the conviction reversed. The problem with relying on the common law in this instance is at common law there were no appeals. There were no appeals in federal criminal cases for capital defendants until 1889 and none for defendants generally till 1891, so the common law really doesn't help you very much. In fact, the Supreme Court had addressed this problem under the Constitution in a case called Stromberg versus California, where the question was whether a defendant who is possibly convicted of one of several bases that may be unconstitutional is entitled to have his conviction reversed. And Stromberg, in a series of cases that came after, uh, decided that where one of the possible bases of the Constitution has one of the possible bases of the conviction may violate the Constitution, the conviction can't stand. He distinguished that on that ground, but to me, it really raises the question of why you'd make a difference. The problem in cases like Stromberg and Griffin is uncertainty. 
You don't know for certain that the jury relied on a permissible ground when it was convicting the defendant. Now in Shad, if all the different bases are permissible, you may not be worried about the jury coming to unanimity on any one of them. But if you know for certain that one or more of them perhaps is invalid, it's odd to say that we're going to presume the jury relied on the one that was valid. So, the common law for Justice Scalia was very helpful because it provided a good starting point on interpreting any statute. He made that clear in a case called Secar versus United States where he said, it is a settled principle of interpretation that absent other indication, Congress intends to incorporate the well-settled meanings of common law terms. It provided not only a good basis, it provided a very strong one where that was a possible outcome in the case, where you have terms like extortion and the like used in statutes that had a common law meaning. He found that to be extraordinarily powerful. It ranked right up there with the text of the statute itself. He also found that the common law provided an objective moral judgment that had to be respected. In cases involving, for example, the uh, Montana versus Engelhoff, the question whether a certain defense uh, was entitled to be raised by a defendant, he looked to the common law to see how England and America had historically treated this defense rather than engaging in the type of cost-benefit analysis or plus-minus analysis that you see in a lot of other cases. He believed that if the common law had consistently rejected a certain point, it would be unreasonable to conclude that the Constitution somehow required that the court today eschew hundreds of years of precedent. But, as I mentioned with respect to Griffin, even Homer nodded. Unfortunately, sometimes the common law can be very seductive. The analysis that relies on what has happened over hundreds of years may not always, as Professor Bieber said, be useful today. He relied on it very heavily in whatever case he could because he believed judges should not be making the law themselves, not just simply the substantive law, but other law of, of the type that we heard about in connection with the Fourth Amendment as well as the Sixth Amendment and elsewhere. For that, he deserves enormous amounts of credit. He actually brought the text of the Constitution and the text of statutes back into play and as being the principal issue in these cases. Judges historically had learned the common law method, started it at Harvard, and they moved from one case to another in a sort of color matching approach. For a variety of cases, he just completely rejected that analysis. Where there was a constitutional provision at, at issue, that's what you had to consider. Where there was a statute at issue, that's what you had to consider. And where the common law provided an answer that may have e existed for centuries, that is what you had to consider too. Because in each of those cases, you were relying on something other than the judge just engaged in the type of balancing that you might see in a tort case, but that he thought was impermissible under the Constitution and in the substantive criminal law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Larkin. Um, you know, because because uh, one of the most interesting parts of these panels is the give and take between the various panelists, I thought I would give a very brief period so that we can get to questions uh, for panelists to respond to any points made by any of the other panelists. So in a brief two minutes, is, do any of you, and it's certainly not mandatory, but do any of you want to respond to the points made by your co-panelists? I'll, I'll bite it. At one, um, in response to, to Paul, um, I'm, I'm a little bit more sympathetic with my colleague Alan Morrison on the issue of whether Justice Scalia was a criminal defendant's uh, best friend. I think his record was, in, in a lot of ways, he was a swing vote in, in criminal law cases more than a reliable vote for um, for defendants. You know, maybe, maybe the way of thinking about it, at least how I think about it, he's, he's much more of a friend of criminal defendants than you would have expected when he joined the court. Uh, maybe it's you know, more of a criminal def defendant's friend than other Republican nominees or other conservatives. Um, and, and so I think his record is, is a little bit more mixed than, than that. And in, in the Fourth Amendment area where um, you know, he got a lot of attention, Justice Scalia got a lot of attention for uh, voting in defendants' favors. It, part of that, I think, was the sort of 
belief that a lot of people had that Justice Scalia must be someone on the government side, and so when he voted for the defense, it was kind of a surprising thing. I sort of think of my friends on the liberal side saying, wow, I never expected to like Justice Scalia's opinion, but it's great. Um, and so I think some of that was the, the surprise a aspect that made people remember those decisions more. Uh, but I, I at least think of him as more someone who, in the Fourth Amendment context, was very much a swing vote in the last, say, 10 years of his uh, career, rather than so much as a defendant's best friend. Oh, well, now I want to weigh in, too, uh, <laughs> just for a minute to say, okay, maybe not best friend, but really good buddy, because <laughs> I think the way to think about it is the cases where he ruled for the defendant instead of the government, these are big areas. These are the ones that Professor Bebas was talking about that are the most monumental criminal justice decisions, at least in the past two decades, I think are these confrontation clause decisions, the Apprendi line of sentencing decision have fundamentally changed the way that criminal justice operates in the United States. And so they weren't just kind of here and there issues. And I understand the Fourth Amendment is a little bit different, but, but those were really big. Now, it didn't mean you always won before him as a criminal defendant, but I think it's important that he was willing to stand behind his principles in areas even when it meant watershed change for the way that business as usual was operating. And in statutory cases, I do not think you had a better friend than Justice Scalia if you were a criminal defendant because he, the, he was a faithful adherent to the text of the statute. And you, time after time, studies have shown no one used the rule of lenity more than Justice Scalia. So as a statutory matter, I think absolutely best friend. In the other context, super good buddy that you wanted along for the ride. And, and I do think you know part of that is maybe the unexpected of a more you know, conservative job. But you know, he, was, he, uh, he was a faithful to constitutional principles in a way that you could anticipate in advance as a litigant arguing cases. And you sort of thought, okay, if I argue this way to Justice Scalia, I have a real chance here. There's a way in which I could do it. With, with some of the other justices, less clear. Um, and I think that goes to the methodological consistency. So um, I think, I'm not saying that's who you'd want over Justice Stevens, um, but, but I think there's a way in which he was really true to his principles in ways that were fundamentally important. All right, I'm gonna pop in here because this little debate actually anticipated the question I wanted to ask the panelists, which is, um, I think that one of the things that's interesting about Justice Scalia's jurisprudence, and I may actually cover this uh, during the showcase panel on Saturday on its constitutional jurisprudence, is the right remedy distinction. Um, on rights, um, I think that uh, Professor Barco makes a great point, which is um, he was open to, and Be Professor Beavis makes the same point, to changing the right, to expanding the right in the Crawford context, perhaps um, in the Fourth Amendment context um, as well. Maryland versus King is, is dissent in that case is an excellent example of that. But when it came to the remedy, um, he seemed to be a little bit more limited in what uh, he would do for a criminal defendant. So the exclusionary rule, for example, um, he was somewhat skeptical of the exclusionary <laughs> rule, to say the least. Um, you know, with respect to the good faith exception, uh, he certainly was a proponent of the good faith exception. And so when you look to the remedy, um, he seemed to not necessarily be the friends of criminal defendants. And so I wonder how, how we can address sort of that dichotomy or that almost tension between the, between the, the, the doctrines. Let, let me just add, I, I think there's an issue on the remedies, and this goes to the post-originalist problem, which is a bunch of the remedies that worked in the colonial era don't work anymore. We have created qualified immunities. We've taken tort cases away from juries. Tort remedies used to do the work in the Fourth Amendment. They don't anymore. And so it's a real problem. I mean, the, uh, what are you going to do about a remedy in that situation? Either you're going to leave you know, too much uh, e exclusion and deterrence, or you're going to leave it in essence un unremedied. And there doesn't seem to be a clear or neat answer to that problem. When it comes to the right, you know, I think it's, it's easier to latch onto as an originalist or textualist matter what the right is, and he was very faithful to that. And I agree, maybe not the best friend, but you know, as a textual matter, take the death penalty. I think people over fixate on the death penalty just because it's high profile. It's actually a very small number of cases. It, you wanna compare it to the broad impact on lots of defendants lower down. But as a textualist matter, I mean, the Constitution refers to capital crimes. And so he's not the defendant's best friend there because I don't think anyone who's principled about the text or original meaning of the Constitution could be. 
Um, and so he's, he's faithful to it, but it, it's unfair to say that that is driven by a hostility to the right. It's just, that's a made up right, basically. Um, and when it comes to remedies, there's a bigger issue as to what is the second best thing you're gonna inevitably be you know, making up or crafting where you can't stick with the original one. And, um, uh, I, I think the remedies point really is an important one. It, it's, it's trying to fit that into Justice Scalia's views is I think a little bit tricky. With the exclusionary rule, just focusing on the Fourth Amendment issues, the exclusionary rule, I think you can say the most plausible reading of the history is that that was not an understood remedy for Fourth Amendment violations. It's a little bit hard because the Fourth Amendment was so much a response to a specific set of cases. And so in trying to figure out what the original public meaning of the Fourth Amendment was, you've got sort of a couple data points and then you can construe it in lots of different ways. It's sort of not obvious how you do that. The, the text of the Fourth Amendment says nothing about what the remedy should be. It's sort of written in a passive voice. Don't do this. This shall not be done. Um, I, I think a, a case I've always struggled with in trying to fit into Justice Scalia's views is his decision in Anderson versus Creighton uh, in 1987, the end of his first term on the court, uh, where he had, uh, wrote an opinion for the court, a very important decision, saying that qualified immunity applies to all Fourth Amendment claims. The plaintiffs in that case raised an originalist argument. They said there was no qualified immunity at common law. The remedy in a direct suit against an officer who violated the Fourth Amendment was damages for trespass. And so that was what the plaintiffs in Anderson versus Creighton uh, claimed. And Justice Scalia's response is, is interesting to read, just two sentences. Um, we have never suggested that the precise contours of official immunity can and should be slavishly derived from the often arcane rules of the common law. Uh, doing so would entangle ourselves in the vagaries of English and American common law, sort of scoffing at the idea <laughs> that the common law rule was the one to follow. And then you say, well, how does that fit with his views of the right, which was so much based on the idea of you have to retain the common law. I've always wondered, was, did Anderson versus Creighton come out that way because it was only Justice Scalia's first term on the court? If that had come up after 20 years or 25 years, would he have said, listen, the common law remedy was trespass, no qualified immunity, uh, and therefore that should be the remedy? Or alternatively, did he take that view because the cause of action in Anderson versus Creighton was a Bivens action, or I, I think it was a federal case, uh, a Bivens action rather than a trespass claim? If somebody had alleged common law trespass, would there be qualified immunity under a Justice Scalia approach? We, we don't know, but I think it's tricky to fit in the remedies issue to the right. Yeah, I think that's a great, can I just really quickly for just sure, oh, It's please. a great question, and the one thing, the one area where I think the tension comes, he really doesn't like, or didn't like any area where it was just left up to the judge to kind of, on their own, and, and I think the, we haven't talked as much about the Eighth Amendment, but you know, you could really make a very strong originalist case that Justice Lee just had the Eighth Amendment wrong, um, and that there's actually a lot of judging that needs to take place with terms like cruel and unusual, and there's you know lots of great historical articles by Professor Stinnefort and others about, you know sorry, that's just a tough area where judges have to kind of do that, mm -hmm. balancing and all those things, and you know Justice Lee did not like that. And, and I do think when you have areas where it's, there's a tension between the bright line reigning judges in, and then one of the other methodologies, you know, those are the tough ones where I think, you know, did he blink sometimes? I think so. I think the Eighth Amendment is one of them, where the idea of just having judges reevaluate whether a sentence goes too far was a scenario that, that was just too hard to bear. <laughs> and so as a result, what the view was, well, no, nothing can be disproportionate um, unless it was the kind of sentence that, you know, drawing and quartering, something that even at the time that you couldn't do otherwise, anything was okay. And, you know, I think that's harder to justify under his methodologies, and I think where he got there was precisely because this remedy question would be so hard and the judging would be so hard that he just, you know, I think that that's for me at least the area where I look and I say, I, I just, I don't agree with I, that. Picking I, up on that, in Lafleur and Fry, it's the same thing. It's really hard to come up with a remedy for bad counsel and plea bargaining, and that is part of what's driving him to say, there can't be a right here because the majority's remedy is so loosey-goosey. I think he probably felt over time the difficulty of, of trying to deal with all of these doctrines that predated him that he had to deal with, such as Bivens. I mean, if you look at the text of the Constitution, there's only one provision that has a remedy, it's the takings clause, and the remedy is you get just compensation. Uh, there isn't a remedy in the Fourth Amendment, and the only remedy, I suppose, in the Sixth Amendment would be just reversing the conviction or making uh, sure that somebody testifies, et cetera. Uh, so he probably would have been very uncomfortable with Bivens, but he, Bivens was decided before he got there. And then 
so did Harlow and the other cases create this uh, doctrine of uh, qualified immunity. I mean, I remember him uh, asking me one time, you know, I'm really uncomfortable with this qualified immunity doctrine. And, and I said, well, if, if you want to rule that all executive branch officials get absolute immunity, we'd be happy with that. Uh, and I think he just was in the position of trying to figure out, okay, I, I can't completely return the world to where it should be, so I'll just try to not make things worse. So one more question, and then we can start lining up here at the at the at the microphone. Um, you know, as a as a state court judge, um, Professor Vivas pointed out some areas where you know these these questions come up a lot in state court. So, the confrontation clause, the right to a jury trial. I don't know how many cases I sat uh, sat on um, where those those um, constitutional rights have been at issue. Now, Justice Thomas is obviously still on the court, but Justice Scalia wrote a lot of the opinions in these areas. He really was a big part of how the doctrine in those areas evolved. And so as someone who has to apply and does apply these, these doctrines on, on a daily or weekly basis, I'm wondering what's next? Um, are, are those doctrines gonna be scaled back under uh, a court without Justice Scalia? Um, is there anything that we can tell? Can, you know, is Justice Thomas gonna carry on the mantle? Certainly. There have been retirements um, that have affected this so-called Apprendi Five and the Crawford Five, um, and it's sort of gone on. Um, but there's a number of, of judge, justices on the court who are skeptical of both of those lines of doctrine. And so I'm curious from the panel, what do you see as the future of those areas of the law? Tough question, I think. Hard to, hard to know. Um, I mean, it's arguable that the Apprendi line had maybe run its course and you know the state sentencing guidelines that were blown up remain blown up and they're not going any further but the court's never going to extend that to indeterminate or unstructured sentencing in the Crawford line of cases I mean we've got this weird situation where justices Sotomayor and Thomas are swinging votes on some of these cases and it's there are factual distinctions among them like does it matter whether the lab report was sealed or not does it matter whether the assailant had a gun or was using his fists? If you know these area doctors, you know that some of the distinctions among some of the cases are very fine ones. And so I don't think the court necessarily has to overrule them, but you know, failing to extend them to very diff, you know, possibly analogous but possibly distinguishable cases in the future is quite possible. But when, when the president says he wants to appoint justices in the mold of Justice Scalia, who knows whether that means originalist and formalist or whether that means tough on crime or, or what. It's really because, you know, a, a Rehnquist conservative is very different from a Scalia conservative and we frankly don't know what's coming next. Yeah, I would, I I would predict that it's, um, it'll be death by a thousand cuts for most of them, honestly. I, I don't think that they'll last. And I think, you know, the lasting legacy, I think, is the methodological one. I do think that for, you know, the foreseeable future that justices are going to be committed to the text and starting with the text first. And I think um, they're going to look at history in a way that they didn't before he was there. And I think those will be lasting legacies that will take far longer to chip away from. Having said that, though, you know, there was a backbone and a set of principles to Justice Scalia that he was happy to be a lone dissenter and he was just happy to stick to his guns on things, even when you had very unsympathetic people. And I, it takes a special kind of person uh, to, to do that, and I would hope that we'd see people like that on the court, um, but uh, I think if you're just kind of an odds maker, the odds of finding another one quite like Justice Scalia are zero, um, and then finding <coughs> that kind of commitment even in the face of really sympathetic government arguments, I mean, you know, you're asking a lot of judges when you ask for that, and it really was a very special person to be able to kind of see the long view. And you know, now we look back at some of his decisions and we just think, oh gosh, Morrison versus Olson, nailed it, you know, but think about at the time, you know, only guy dissenting, you know, voice in the wilderness kind of thing, and I, I do think you need a personality type and a set of core principles and a spine of steel to keep doing that and uh, it's very hard and you know everything we know about social psychology and group dynamics and everything else suggests that that'll be very hard to replicate and and, and, and building on that I mean what's so striking about Justice Scalia is not only did he have the methodological commitments but he stuck to his guns uh, he would press them at oral argument and so a lot of counsel would incorporate that you know I think uh, I'll, some Supreme Court practitioners had too much of a fear of Justice Scalia. This was particularly true 
we have new Supreme Court uh, advocates where they would say, I'm so worried about how Justice Scalia is going to respond, I'm basically gonna craft the brief uh, in large part in response to him, and you say, well, he's really only one vote, uh, but because he was so strong at oral argument and was you know, pressing his methodological approaches throughout, he had that outside influence, and it's not clear to me that you will have someone, even, even someone who sort of has that similar uh, methodology and sort of view of the world, that they'll have that influence because they just won't be as strong as First Amendment. On the Sixth Amendment, the Apprendi line of cases, I think that probably won't change. And the reason is, I think the reason the court came down the way it did was it saw leg that legislatures were gaming the system. Mm -hmm. McMillan was the first case that came along, and once McMillan seemed to approve this, it seemed that legislatures thought, great. Now all these important factors that we otherwise would have thought should be treated as elements of an offense are now just sentencing factors, and we'll let the judge do it. And so you could be basically convicted of hitting somebody with your fist and then wind up sentenced for murder because of all the different add-ons that happened as a result. And I think these are very savvy people up there and they know that if they take their foot off that break, it's just gonna come back. So I don't think that that's gonna come back. Um, on the Fourth Amendment, I think ironically, the court has spent so much time over the last 20 years, you know, his time there as well as elsewhere, trying to come up with rules that they are eventually gonna create so many rules that it is impossible for a police officer to know which of the rules to follow. And that someday, if they keep going in this direction, they'll get back just to a general reasonableness test. Uh, he didn't seem to like that. I know Oren says he, he didn't seem to like that, but that was always, for me, one of the oddities of his jurisprudence. I mean, he hated just general reasonableness judgments, but this was a provision in the Constitution that used that precise term. So why have all these rules when it just says be reasonable? And eventually, we may even wind up getting there. Fair point. All right, questions. Feel free to, to, to go to the, the podium if you have questions. Go ahead. Yes. Is it? We can hear you, I think. Okay. It wasn't on. We can okay. hear you, though. Okay. I have a big mouth, so. <laughs> um, I, I certainly can relate to what you were saying about how these. Um, issues that come up in the criminal law, particularly whether something is reasonable under the totality of the circumstances, did the police officer have um, grounds to stop an individual? And I guess my question is, um, as you know, very, it's so fact-based that just one or two different facts, if you will, could completely change whether or not the um, stop or search or seizure was in fact reasonable. So I guess my question is, what, is there a, a method of, a, a, or a particular legal doctrine um, under Justice Scalia's method of interpreting the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? Is there a way in which um, the totality of the circumstances could be, could have more of a bright line rule, or is it just completely uh, impossible under his uh, way of interpreting the Constitution? Thank you. Well, I, I, there are some Fourth Amendment issues where you know, Arizona versus Hicks, moving a turntable a few inches equals a search. You know, the, the, the cartilage versus open fields distinctions and searches, there, there were some areas where there was a rule and the rule came from common law. And so uh, you don't have to get to the totality of the circumstances if you, if you have one of those. And those are areas where I think the, the rule had some staying power. I mean, I'm not sure if you can say Arizona can't uh, versus Gantt is an originalist decision. It's a it's a formalist decision, and you kind of have a clear rule that comes out again. It comes from his idiosyncratic fifth vote, um, but uh, I, I leave it to Oren as to whether that has sticking power or not. Yeah, I, I don't see the court as likely to overturn Gantt. I, I think Justice Scalia never had an answer to, you know, how do you get around the fact-specific standards like probable cause or reasonable suspicion, or general reasonableness. I mean, an example of this is Scott versus Harris, a case on excessive force, 
uh, excessive force requiring the justices to say whether the use of force was reasonable and he kind of apologetically said, you know, we're gonna have to slosh through the fact-bound morass of reasonableness. It's the sense of like, we have no choice but to do this horrible thing and consider the totality of the circumstances because that's just what we're left with. It's the nature of the inquiry. So I don't think he had a way around that except to cabin the doctrine with rules where rules were available. Kind of what is a search? Come down to a bright line rule. This is a search, this is not a search. Uh, but the ultimate question of justifying uh, searches or seizures, there were just gonna be contexts where there was no other way around but a fact specific inquiry. I think it would have been fascinating to have Justice Scalia on the court at the time they decided Terry versus Ohio. Because I think he would have thought there's no doubt that reaching into somebody's pocket is a search. But I also think he would have thought there's no doubt that stopping somebody to ask questions is not a seizure. I think he would have said seizures are taking someone into custody to charge them with a crime or taking goods for which, say, a tax hasn't been paid or something like that. I mean, you take a look at the opinion in Terry versus Ohio. The entire analysis of whether this is a seizure occurs on one page where Earl Warren says, well, gee, if this isn't the seizure, then police officers can do this for all sorts of reasons we don't like. He paid no attention to the common law, the meaning of seizure, or anything like that. It was purely a consequentialist approach. We don't like the consequences of not treating this as being governed by the Fourth Amendment, so it is. I think he would have rebelled at that notion. I think he would have said that the, the cities, the states, the federal government could all regulate the interaction of police officers up and until the point there's a seizure and stopping somebody in the street isn't one. But he clearly, I think, would have said that what happens after that, you reach into somebody's pockets, that's definitely a search. So he, he probably would have been somewhat, you know, looking both ways, I think, in a case like that. So if you wanted to make him gasp, you just had to mention totality of the circumstances as the test. I remember there was one opinion where he, it was the old TH apostrophe, yeah. old <laughs> totality of the circumstances. It was like the key of now you're about to do something lawless. So I think at least <laughs> in so far as you were in that box, that was a troubling box. Let's go to the next question. Uh, thank you. My name is Bill Otis. I'm a part-time law professor at Georgetown. Uh, it was an hour into our discussion before Professor Bebus, you mentioned the death penalty. Uh, it seems to me that the portrayal of Justice Scalia as a friend of defendants when he thought that, only when he thought the text of the Constitution required it is somewhat misleading. In fact, the death penalty had no better friend and no more eager uh, proponent on the Supreme Court than Justice Scalia and I would give as the foremost example, it's concurrence in Kansas versus Marsh, which I continue to use when I debate the death penalty as the best argument for its textual grounding uh, in the Constitution and the best argument against the dissenting opinion in Glossop versus Gross of Justices Breyer uh, and Ginsburg that the death penalty was unconstitutional opinion that I think uh, Justice Scalia said pretty clearly could not possibly be squared with the text of the Constitution. I also dissent from the view that, apart from remedies, and the death penalty can be viewed as a kind of a remedy for the worst defendants, in the matter of rights that uh, Justice Scalia uh, turned out to be a friend of defendants. And I recall specifically uh, his dissenting opinion in, the, in Dickerson versus United States, in which he exposed the Miranda decision which is probably in the public mind, uh, one of the most important, if not the most important, decision in criminal procedure uh, that he exposed Miranda as essentially a fabrication of what the Fifth Amendment commands and pointed out that not only the automatic exclusionary rule in Miranda, but the warnings themselves are nowhere required or even suggested in the Fifth Amendment. So um, I, uh, I would ask, what is your, in light of these considerations, uh, whether you think Justice Scalia was indeed the friend of defendants that he has been portrayed so far today? I think what I would say is 
you know, a good friend, but you'd never go beyond your principles for your friends, right? So I have a lot of friends, <laughs> um, but I wouldn't violate my my fo core fundamental principles for them. And I think, you know, so at least insofar as I was talking about it, you know, if you had a legal argument that had merit, absolutely, he didn't let the kind of what may be a knee-jerk impulse toward the facts of the case or where the sympathies lie. But if you didn't have a legal argument, and in the examples that you gave, really would not be consistent with Justice Scalia's methodologies. You know, as Professor Beavis pointed out, there's capital punishment is in the text of the Constitution, and the Miranda remedy was created by the court, and so in those areas, those aren't the kinds of contexts where his methodology would ever allow those kinds of things. And so I guess when I say, friend, to the extent within the bounds of what is acceptable legal argument, absolutely he would be open-minded, and if the Constitution gave you a right as a criminal defendant, even if it hurt the government, made the government's case more difficult, you know, were in a particular case you wouldn't want it, it didn't matter, he would stick to his constitutional guns. And so I guess that to me, that when I think of, you know, a judge and, and what it means to be friendly or not to an argument, I guess what I'm saying is open-minded, you know, and, and I think he truly was that and wasn't someone, so if, you know, if the framers gave a robust set of rights in the Sixth Amendment, other contexts, he was all in um, and he didn't pull his punches. On the other hand, if there wasn't a textual or historical basis for something, you know, you were out of luck. I think I can second both what Professor Barco said and what, what Mr. Otis said. I have to, he's so quotable, but his dissent in Dickerson is, is, is brilliant. He, he criticized Miranda as a, quote, milestone of judicial overreaching and the court's reaffirmation of it as, quote, the very Cheops pyramid, or perhaps the Sphinx would be a better analog of judicial arrogance. I mean, he was willing to call out when the judges were making things up, but when the Constitution actually took him there, that's where he went. So I think you're both right. All right, next question. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> Paul Kamen, our Washington attorney. I was going to ask about Dickerson. I was, I was sat, sat, sat second chair with Professor Paul Cassell, who argued that, and, and Justice Scalia agreed with us. So since that question has been asked, let's, let me ask a different one. Uh, Professor Bibas, you talked about uh, Justice Scalia's uh, Sixth Amendment jurisprudence. Uh, how would you think he would have ruled in uh, Lewis versus the United States, where he heard the, the argument in November but passed away? before it was decided, in that case held that the pre-seizure of untainted assets of the defendant violated his Sixth Amendment right to counsel. It was a 5-3 decision, so his vote would not have made a difference. But based on your uh, discussion of his more limited rule, the, uh, uh, role of the Sixth Amendment, how do you think he would have uh, ruled in the Louis case? I, I vaguely remember that in Kaplan versus Drysdale, he was one of the votes in the five justice majority that said you could freeze a defendant's assets, um, and so you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that he necessarily, as an as an original matter, absent precedent, would have said that you have a right to appointed counsel as opposed to the the way it was read in the 18th century to retain your own lawyers. He never rejected the precedent that that had established that, but whether he would have extended it to say that you have a right to keep the funds you need to hire your own lawyer. I mean, it's it's dubious that he would have gone the extra step, but I don't know. All right, we have a couple minutes left. I'm gonna ask the other unanswered question, unasked question that I had, which goes to uh, Professor Barco's uh, presentation, which is um, one of the things I actually find fascinating about Justice Scalia is in some of his opinions, he suggests um, that the rule of lenity may very well be a first resort and not a last resort. And he's made that point at various points in his career, but. Of course, the rule of lenity can be a, is a pretty heavy finger on the scale of the, of the criminal defendant. And I know that Justice Thomas and other sort of, quote, conservative members of the court have often viewed the rule of lenity as a last resort, not as a first resort. And so my question is, what explains that? Um, and are there any sort of, you know, principles lying in the background uh, that sort of set uh, Justice Scalia apart? And certainly anyone can answer. It's just... Uh, that particular presentation sort of brought that question about. Yeah, I mean, I see it as consistent with so, so his administrative law jurisprudence and statutory interpretation there where, you know, there's, so there's two steps under Chevron and Justice Scalia you almost never got to step two. <laughs> you know, so he didn't have to defer to an agency mm -hmm. because under step one he found the statute clear. I, I think this is kind of the mirror image of that where he looks at a criminal <coughs> statute and if it's 
just not clear on its face. I guess I don't know if, you, if it's first step, second step, you right. know, but I think if it's just not clear on its face, there is this, you know, tie goes to the defendant. Um, and I think for some of the other justices, there's, there's more of a willingness, to, certainly for the justices who use legislative history, um, they're rarely gonna get there. For the justices as committed as he was to not using that, you know, they maybe, maybe would be a little more likely to get there using kind of structure, other textual cl clues. Um, but, but I think for him, you know, the, the real, it was a venerable canon, it's a common law tradition that like, like no other. And so whenever he would talk about statutory interpretation canons, you know, the rule of lenity was kind of numero uno in terms of what you had in the arsenal, um, both because of its historical pedigree, but also as a matter of just thinking in a government, um, if you rule for the government and you're wrong as a court, what's the kind of criminal defendant gonna do? You know, march back to Congress and say, oh, you know, you got this wrong. You really, won't you rule in favor of criminal defendants? And we know as an empirical matter um, that in fact, uh, Congress is very unlikely to act when defendants lose. In contrast, when the government loses, Congress often does fix the statute. And so I think it's both a historical matter and just an operation, a good government matter. There's a way in which you insist on clarity and you use lenity to make Congress be clear. And I do think he had a lot of those canons that was basically to force Congress to do a better job. Uh, and I think that's another reason why for him it was easier to say uh, lenity because then it's not that hard for Congress to come back and rule against a criminal defendant in our system. You know, in our system, the, the individual, it's just very hard to get those kind of protections, whereas the government has so much sway. And so I think for all those reasons, whether you call it first step, last step, you know, an easy step for him, because I think both as, as history, as commitment to textualism, and then this kind of government idea of, come on, at least, you know, I think what he said in Sykes and other decisions is it's just so easy for Congress to make a slapdash law, um, but there should be more care that's taken uh, before you take somebody's liberty away. I've always seen his focus of, on the rule of lenity as really an, an outgrowth of his focus on separation of powers. Uh, so, you know, Justice Scalia, a strong sense of, listen, there are three branches, they each have their role, they can't get out of their role. The role of the legislature is defining what is a crime. If they didn't define what is a crime, they failed at their job and have to go back and do it again. And the answer of other judges would be, well, we can fill it in, we can help them along, the judges can do a little bit of the legislative role. And I think Justice Scalia's you know, strong rule of lenity principle, I've always understood it to be reflecting this idea of no, we don't help the other branch. We have individual roles and we have to stick with those. So it's that commitment to the separation of powers driving the rule of lenity and, and less concern than maybe other justices were about the consequences that might follow from that in terms of this one case, instead focusing on the need for the legislature to do its job. And complementary to that, I would stress notice which is if you're using being a textualist reading the statute, you could plausibly consult with an attorney to read this statute, but it's not likely that you're gonna be able to understand legislative history in the way that a court in hindsight is eventually going to get it. And so if you get to it at the last step after you've rummaged through a bunch of other materials, really hard to say you've had clear, fair warning. Whereas if you're just looking at the face of the text, it's at least more plausible. Now again, I suggest that that was a fiction in part, but it still might be a useful fiction in terms of constraining sources and, uh, and, and, and providing some, some notice, as well as some constraint on discretion, because the critique of legislative history is you have too many sources out on the table, the judges or prosecutors pick the sources that they like, as opposed to all being on the, the same page, quite literally, the page of the statutory text. I think it also reflected not simply a separation of powers jurisprudence and concerns, but also his concerns about the role of government and liberty. I think there were a lot of justices that would be willing to adopt, say, over broad interpretations of the statute, assuming that the government would pick only the really bad actors to prosecute. And I think he saw that as being an improper way for the courts to act, that liberty was important. And unless a statute clearly said you could be deprived of it, the government was not entitled to deprive you of it. They could always go back and change it, but unless and until they did, there was a presumption in favor of reading in favor of liberty rather than reading it the opposite way. Okay. All right, so a little housekeeping. Uh, buses at a post meters bus. The Lord for the annual dinner can be boarded on the DeSalle Street side of the hotel. You can access the street by exiting the hotel at the door to the outside near the gift shop. Please ask a staff member if you're confused and they can direct you. Buses will leave for, uh, for the Gaylord from now until 6 p.m. For the return trip, buses will depart at the conclusion of the dinner. <laughs> <laughs>
um, and then every half hour with the last bus loading at 11.30 p.m. But before we go, please give a round of applause to our excellent panelists. Thank you.